Well, number one, you treat them the way you want to be treated. Love, respect, honor them, help them. That's what I consider being a neighbor. Uh, late night, something go on, or any part of the daytime, something go on. I feel that you should be able to reach out to your neighbor and help, get them help a hand, whether it's yard work, changing a tire, uh, squirting the water for them while they're out there washing their car. I mean, it's just neighborly things, just to get to know one another, that which we very rarely have today. Um, I think kindness and courtesy, um, respect, mutual respect and understanding, compassion. Um, I was raised that way. I don't know that all of us were, but I think if we could just find it in our hearts to approach people with kindness and respect and um, just some compassion, general compassion for human needs, that that in itself serves as a strong basis for how we relate to each other. Like I want to be treated. That means I respect you. If you got to work in the morning, I don't pull up in my yard with loud music playing and I expect the same treatment. If we share, if there's an apartment and some of you walls are paper thin, I live in one. Um, be mindful that you do have neighbors and don't make all that noise and doing all that knowing that people have to get up and go to work. So I just say respect one another. Well, God asks us mm -hmm. to love our neighbor as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the greatest commandment. That's how we're to treat our neighbors. So how do you do that? By just getting to know them and knowing mm -hmm. their needs. All right, week three. This is halfway through this series. Won't you be my neighbor? First two weeks, we gave you kind of the theory behind all of this. So week number one, we asked the question, where, uh, who moved my neighborhood? Talked about how the world has changed. And if the world has changed, how do we respond to it? And one of the things we said, that the core truth of this whole series from Psalm 111, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Right? And then Colossians chapter 1, that Jesus is the center of all things. All things were created through him and for him. So if Jesus is at the center of everything, and this is all God's world, and Jesus moved into the neighborhood, that means that everything belongs to God. Everything. And Jesus is in everything. So the neighborhood is anywhere we meet other people. Whether that's physical places here in downtown Albany, or that's digital places, the internet, social media, chat rooms, whatever. It all belongs to God. It's all part of this universe. That was week one. And then week two, we asked not who is my neighbor, but how do I see my neighbor? Because if it all belongs to God, that means that in some way, everybody in the neighborhood is our neighbor. Everybody's our neighbor. But we don't always treat everybody like our neighbor, right? So how do we start to see one another as our neighbors? And we talked a lot about compassion suffering with, being able to see other people's suffering as our own suffering, to see ourselves in other people. Remember I talked about the kid on the bus? Being able to, to see yourself in somebody else's pain. That could be me in that situation. So that gets us to this morning, how should I treat my neighbor? If we know that Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, how do we do that? How do we put flesh and blood onto love in the neighborhood, physical or digital. This question is huge because whether you realize it or not, in this new neighborhood, you have incredible reach and power. Incredible reach in ways we really haven't ever had before to either connect people to Christ's transforming love or to push them away from it. The first time I, I really experienced and witnessed the power of the, the physical and the digital communities coming together in a way that, that was transformative was back when my dad had his accident. And I know I've talked about this before up here, and I don't want to uh, beat a, an almost dead horse, but, uh, but my dad in 2012, at their, their home in upstate New York, um, got off the phone with me, it was, it was Cade's birthday, and drove to the local Walmart because... You know, it's Walmart, and you got to do something at Walmart on Sunday afternoon. So drove his work van. Somehow it didn't get all the way into park. He hopped out of it, and it rolled backwards, caught his, his right foot, pulled him up underneath the van, and, uh, and the van went over him from his right side across his chest over his left shoulder, um, leaving him almost dead and, and, and almost did die because of it. But he was airlifted to a local trauma center, 
um, in, in Rochester, New York. And from that point forward, the neighborhood, the new neighborhood, just came to life. Because at the time we were in North Carolina, they were in New York. There, there wasn't, we weren't physically close to one another. And God was really working through it all. First, my mom called me on my cell phone to tell me about the accident. And then after I heard about it, I was so shocked that the only thing I could think to do was to call a woman in our congregation and ask her to pray for me. And we weren't together, but she prayed for me over the phone. And while she was praying for me on my cell phone, my wife was calling friends of ours on her cell phone, who then came to our house and watched the kids so that I could do work on my phone and so that Summer could get on the internet on her computer and book flights for us to Rochester. So the next day before we left for the airport, I put a post on Facebook telling the world about the accident. This is what happened. Please keep us in your prayers. By the time we landed in Rochester, I had a, a voicemail from a friend of my parents who lived in their town. I called her back and she said she would watch my parents' dog because she had a key to the house. She would watch my parents' dog so that my mom could stay at the hospital with my dad. Awesome. Um, and then we were at the airport. I got a text from my best friend to say, stick tight. I am coming to the hospital to pick you up so you don't have to pay for a cab to go, or coming to the airport to pick you up so you don't have to pay for a cab to go to the hospital. So he went. We spent that first day with my dad in the hospital. And when we got home, exhausted, hungry, we said, somebody said on the way in, what are we going to do for dinner? We hadn't even thought about eating. You know how you get caught up in those moments and you just forget the basics. And we opened the door, and there sitting on the dining room table was a hot meal prepared by members of my parents' church who had seen the Facebook post, contacted the friend who was watching the dog who had a key to let him into the house to put the meal on the table. Everything working together in a way that was good and powerful, physical, digital, the love of Christ working through it all. And in a true sign of God's presence, maybe the truest in the whole experience, my old youth group leader saw the Facebook post and came over with three half gallons of ice cream. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise Jesus. Surely the Lord was in that place. Literally, hundreds of cards arrived in the mail over the course of the following two weeks from all around the country. People we knew, people we hadn't talked to in decades talking about how wonderful my dad was and how they loved him and anything they could do, just give a call. And then there were people we'd never heard of before who were friends of friends on Facebook. Just to share, we had a similar experience. You are in our thoughts and prayers. So by the time I left to go back home, my parents' friends, through texts and emails, had arranged people to drive him to all his scheduled surgeries, follow-up surgeries, every one of his physical therapy appointments, everything was covered so that my mom could go back to work. It was beautiful. I mean, it was this new neighborhood at its best, face-to-face, -face, digital, online, prayers, cards, all the love woven together in all those ways transformed just this god-awful situation into something, it was a blessing. It drew my family closer together, it drew us closer together with other people, and it drew us closer to God. And those friends and relatives and strangers did exactly what we've been talking about in this series. Exactly. They looked at my father and mother and me and my sister and they saw neighbors. They had compassion. And they acted in the ways that the new neighborhood provides. There's, there's beauty and power in this. And you can do the exact same thing. You can do, starting today, the exact same thing. You heard, maybe, in the back it was a little hard, but you, you heard your neighbors in the opening video. There was no script when I asked them that question. How do you treat your neighbors? How should you treat your neighbors? There were no prompts. I guess they knew that I was a pastor, so maybe they used some churchy language they wouldn't have otherwise, but they just gave their gut reaction. 
But did you notice when they were asked how you should treat your neighbor, there was no hesitation? Some of the other questions, you asked somebody like, what's your neighborhood? Uh, but how should you treat your neighbor? They were on it. It was immediate. You treat them the way you want to be treated. Respect them. Help them. You treat them lovingly, as Christ would for us. Kindness, mercy, courtesy, respect, understanding, compassion. Treat them like I want to be treated. Respect one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. That was the immediate response. What these folks did pretty much was just quote scripture. Right there in your bulletin this morning, Matthew 7, verse 12. Jesus said, do in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. That's it. When you ask people on the street how to treat their neighbors, you immediately get the golden rule. It's like it's inside us. We instinctively know it. And I believe that that's true. That that golden rule, treat other people like you want to be treated, is inside us. Implanted there by the God who created us and created this whole creation good. It's there, we know it, we feel it. But then, you look at the world and how it operates, and it becomes pretty clear that even though we may know it, we're not exactly living it. We're not in the way that we could. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Easy to say, but a lot harder to do. The truth is that the same new neighborhood that can bless people, it can curse people too. A blessing or a curse, and people are doing both right now. We've done both, bless and curse. The same physical and digital neighborhoods that nurtured my family after my dad's accident can be used to spread rumors. They can be used to destroy relationships. They can even be used when they're in the wrong hands to lead whole countries in the wrong direction or start wars. We have incredible reach and power in the new neighborhood. We can love our neighbors or hate them. And people in this new neighborhood are loving and hating. We can all say the golden rule and we can quote Jesus, but what we need is people who will live it out. Not just be able to say it, but will we'll make concrete actions toward putting it into action. And again, in your bulletins, there's Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. And I invite you to have it in front of you. And even take out, take out a pen, because I'm going to give three possible ways that I see to live this out. And you can write it in the margin. If you have a phone, it's okay, because this is about technology and that. Take a note on your phone of this, or, or record it. I don't know, whatever you want to do. But Micah 6, 6 through 8. This is one of the most famous teachings in the entire Old Testament. And I think it can give us kind of a framework for putting the golden rule into action in the new neighborhood. So ready. These verses in Micah are part of a conversation between God and God's people. So the people ask in verse 6, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the Lord on high? Asking, what is acceptable to you, God? What, what will, will make things right in your eyes? What will bring us together? What will heal this relationship? And they give some examples. You know, we'll, we'll give all kinds of stuff. Calves and hundreds of this and hundreds, thousands of, of well, you know, oil running all over the place. The best of the best of the best offerings. But God responds in verse 8 that, and this is really where the gold mine is for living out the golden rule. God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Those three things. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. 
And there really is no way to go any deeper than surface level. This is one of the most dense, chewed on pieces in the Bible. But I'm just going to make some some suggestions. And they can be put to action in, in the physical or the digital neighborhoods. These are just overall rules. So, first, do justice. What does it mean to do justice? Justice in the Bible means something like peace or wholeness. You may have heard the Hebrew word shalom before. It, it's, it's this ultimate peace. It's the world as God intends it to do, uh, intended it to be. It's the broken pieces of the world put back together. It's about setting relationships right. So what can we do? What's, what's one thing that we can do in the physical and the digital world to start to set relationships right again? And here's the first thing that popped into my mind. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Whew. So write that in the margin. Take it home with you. And just marinate in that a little bit. Tell the truth. We're in an era where it seems like the truth either doesn't matter anymore, or it's almost impossible to know who's telling the truth and who's not. And so people just seem to kind of not be worrying about that anymore. A basic pursuit of the truth. I had just, I mean, we're just this past week we're talking about a, there was an indictment of, of Russians meddling in the election. And again, it, you know, who cares if it vindicates or doesn't vindicate or who's right or wrong? The truth is people saw totally false things and believed them and shared them. And they, they were not real. It's, it's fake. Um, along the lines of the Won't You Be My Neighbor series, I've had three people since this started tell me that Mr. Rogers, do you know why he wears the red cardigan? Have you heard this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was because he was in the Vietnam War uh, or World War II or whatever war he was in. Um, and he killed all kinds of people. And he was so hurt and wounded by this that he made it his life's mission to do the kids' programming and bring peace to the world. And he, he's all tattooed up. He's tatted up, Mr. Rogers, which is why he wore the red cardigan. This story is so far from the truth, it's not even funny. I mean, Mr. Rogers was never in the military, uh, ever. He was in college during, during the war. Um, and then he, he got out. And, I mean, no, 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 no. And he was a pacifist, which doesn't make the, the war bad. It just means that wasn't true. That's not a true story. Um, he's a pacifist vegetarian. The, the dude did, wasn't on a killer. Um, but, but yet people just pass it on. Did you know? No, no, did you know? <laughs> you better be sure. Because can you imagine? Because you know the damage that happens when things that are not the truth just get passed along. Just passed along. You've probably been on the receiving end of it at one point in your life or another. But can you imagine if everybody who claimed to follow Christ just made that simple commitment? I will not say, write, post, tweet, or otherwise pass along anything unless I am 100% sure that it is true. Things would change. I mean, relationships would be healed. There would be an impact in that. Next, Love kindness. The second thing, love kindness. This can also be translated love mercy. It doesn't just mean be a nice person. But it's somewhere along that line. Christian teachers Heidi Campbell and Stephen Gardner say that loving mercy means being faithfully and actively committed to others in the same way that God is faithful and active toward us. It means building people up. Not breaking people down. It means being in God's business. Building people up. So, next to love mercy or love kindness, can you write, don't be a jerk. Don't be a jerk. This goes pretty well with, with tell the truth, I think. But, uh, but don't be a jerk. Can we just stop treating people like garbage already? I know. God. Now, I hold a PhD in sarcasm. It was really good. I am from New York, and I embrace that. Not because it's better than anywhere else, but, you know, you learn certain lessons. And sarcasm is the way to go. 
The Wells family also has those New York values. They were here yesterday, and man, we communicated with one another. It was great. Tell each other off, just bam. As my mom always used to say, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. But in the new neighborhood, that doesn't work really well. You know, it is fun. It can be fun to call people stupid or ignorant or, or to pass along that really juicy piece of gossip. And it is so easy in the new neighborhood to do it because a lot of the time you don't even need to look at each other anymore. You can just drop the stink bomb and get out of Dodge before anything bad happens. So it, it hurts the other person but doesn't really damage you at all. But words do matter. And words do hurt people. And if you are going to love mercy, just, just don't be a jerk. It really is what your parents taught you is true. It's better if you don't have something good to say to just not talk. I can't tell you how many times I have written the diatribe to post on Facebook in response to something and then just highlighted it all and deleted and I don't remember which famous politician it is. There were probably a bunch. Abraham Lincoln is usually used, who wrote the letters, the scathing letters to people, and sealed them up and just put them in the desk. Just, just love mercy. Tell the truth. Don't be a jerk. And the last, walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly with your God. And this is the one that holds it all together. And you can write next to this one, remember Jesus. So remember Jesus. The reason you do to others what you want them to do to you, the reason you love your neighbor as yourself is to invite other people to experience Jesus. That's what you're designed to do. It's what God made us to do. To offer to other people in the world an experience of Jesus Christ. So every uplifting conversation, every encouraging Facebook post, every hug given to a grieving person, every heartfelt sympathy offered online is doing something. It's not just being nice. It's offering Jesus himself to other people. We have to remember why we do what we do. That being a neighbor isn't just to, to be neighborly. It's the fact that this is God's neighborhood. It belongs to God and Jesus is the one who's over and through and in the neighborhood. It's why we do what we do. It's who we are. It is our identity. We must remember that. That scared me at first. I didn't know what that was. We do it all because as we said here in the very first week of this series, we believe that this world and everything in it belongs to Jesus. And if that's true, then this world and every person and everything in it has the potential to be redeemed and transformed by Christ's loving power. Everything. And that's why we exist, to tell that truth. That's why we do what we do in this building and in downtown Albany and on the internet. Everything we do is to connect people to our Savior. Everything. Everything. So next week, we wrap up this whole conversation. And we're finally going to do what people told me at the door after the first week they wanted to do. Or at least they just started doing, which is talk about how bad everything is. Okay? We're going to talk about the dangers of the new neighborhood. We're going to talk about the most dangerous thing and what it is and how to avoid it so that we can be effective in our mission. That's next week. But one more time before we move on, whether you realize it or not, you have incredible reach and power in this new neighborhood. You have power to touch others with Christ's transforming love, to build them up or to break them down. Through your acts of justice and kindness and humble love for God, your neighbors can and will experience Christ's love in their lives. And you will too. And Christ's love is the only thing that has the power to heal you and this world forever. Amen.